two, one. Welcome to Southern Sense Talk Radio with your host, the radio chick, Annie Ubellis. Join Annie on Tuesdays and Fridays at 2 p.m. Eastern Time with an open chat room full of her regulars. And yes, you can even call in. Call 917-889-3675. That's 917-889-3675 to be a part of the action on the phone line. Not able to listen live? Not a problem. You can always catch Annie, the radio chick, and Southern Sense Talk Radio podcast in archives at southern-sense.com. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Southern Sense the right way. Ooh, Merry Christmas and welcome. You're here listening to Southern Sense here on Blog Talk Radio, High Plains Media, SHR Media, Kinetic Hi-Fi, The Fix FM out of Charleston, South Carolina. I'm your hostess with the mostest, the radio chick, Annie, along with my co-host today, Curtis C.S. Bennett. Curtis, Merry Christmas and welcome back over the holiday. Oh, we got to unmute Curtis. Uh, it helps when we have Curtis unmuted. Good afternoon, Curtis. Can you hear me again? No, we got you now. Got you now. Oh, okay. <laughs> what we I was got... saying was that we have less we have less than thirty days before we get a new president, and I can't wait. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah! You know, we've we've got the uh, holiday staff working the switchboard today. We'll we'll use that excuse. How does that sound? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we're going to have Kel Fritzy from Red Fox Radio joining us as soon as she can dial in. We got ourselves a great show uh, lining up. It's something a little bit different, a little bit special because of the holidays. Um, we're going to have our dedication as well as something personal that happened to me over these holidays, which I call a Christmas miracle. And then at the second half of the hour, we have returning the comedian Rodney Lee Conover, who is now the editor for Joe for America. Remember Joe the Plumber? He's got his own website that's been up for a couple of years. A really excellent news website, commentary website. And he's out there. Uh, and Rodney Lee has been running that. So we're going to be talking about a lot, a lot, a lot of different things so we have a lot going on so Kel please get on the phone and call in so we can uh, introduce you here want to welcome everyone that's listening in on their smart devices as well as those that are coming into the chat room and I know it is um, a holiday weekend so I appreciate it all the more that you are taking time off of your holiday special uh, schedule to join us it's always fun to see our friends out there in the chat Uh, how was your Christmas Curtis so far, it's been just been wonderful. Um, like I said, my mother had a stroke um, just before Christmas, and uh, she's recovering quite well. So that turned out to be a, a blessing, and uh, she's still with us. But you know, we didn't get any snow here in Florida, but I'm not too <laughs> disappointed because we rarely do. <laughs> so and then I went up north and didn't get any while I was up there. So I guess it's just not meant for this year for me to see snow. <laughs> I would have to probably go to Canada, <laughs> up in Kell's territory, right? Oh man, you know it's oh, it's, yeah. it's been um, a little bit of a difficult Christmas for me, you know. Um, but we'll get into that a little bit later on. Um, we do a dedication, yeah. and today's dedication is completely different. It's not the usual dedication. And, Curtis, I want you to join with me. And if Kel will call in, uh, we can get her input, because this is more of a conversational dedication rather than one that I normally read. And then, you know, we play the dedication music. This is just a little bit different. So I want your input as we talk about it, because I have nothing written, nothing scripted. It's all off the top of my head. And today's dedication, when you stop and think about it, and this is what um, really, really got me. And Kel's saying she couldn't 
get to dial in. Uh, Curtis, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you Kel's phone number. Or Kel, message Curtis in the chat room. Give him your phone number so that he can dial you in like I did last time. Does that sound good, Curtis, if you do that? Yeah. Yeah, all right. Kel, I am... I am Curtis, and give him the number, and he'll dial dial you in. But as I was sitting in the hospital, and I was looking around at all these marvelous people that were working there, uh, helping all of those of us that you know, had family that was either injured, ill, or whatever, and it dawned on me, and, you know, I never really thought about it, because, you know, being a police officer, you knew you are going to work holidays. You know, that was a given. And if he got them off, that was a blessing. But I'm looking at all the other people besides first responders that work on the holidays to help us in our emergencies, in our daily lives, the things that go on behind the scene that we never say thank you for. And that is what this show is dedicated to. It's dedicated to all of the first responders, to all of our military men and women, and all of the other heroes who could not be at home with friends and family during this Christmas holiday. That's who this show is going out to. You know, sitting in the hospital, you know, you stop and think about it. You've got the staff that's doing the clerical paperwork that come in on the holiday. You've got the janitorial staff that's coming through to make sure the hospital rooms are clean and neat. You've got the nurses and the doctors and the physical therapists and the technicians and all the myriad of the staff in just the hospital. And then you expand that out to the police, to the first responders, to the law enforcement, to the clerical staff, and to all the other staff that help support uh, the law enforcement as they're out there on patrol, to the courts, to the jails, to the restaurants, to the city and county and parish services that make sure the streets are safe and clear, to all those people you don't think about that are behind the scenes and as you go from friend to neighbor to family to exchange your holiday thanks and gifts you don't think about these people you all you're thinking about is focusing on getting to your next destination and what's going to be there to eat and drink and what gifts are you going to give and what gifts you're going to get you don't think about all those people Mm -hmm. behind the scenes that make it possible i could tell you i could tell you this much having been away during the Christmas holidays, especially during um, Desert Storm back in the old Gulf War, the original one. It, it was it was um, really great to get care packages from home and letters to any any service men or and it basically was servicemen at the time. I guess today would be servicemen and and service women. But um, it was it was good to know that we had the support of the American people behind us when we were facing um, the um, battle of all the mother of all battles, as um, Saddam Hussein called it. But um, you know, hopefully today that support is still there for our military men and women uh, abroad and at home, because we have a lot of people who, even though they're they're here in the United States. They're not really near where their hometowns are, you know. They're stationed somewhere out in the boondocks or the desert, maybe even the Antarctic, you know. So yeah. they, they would appreciate it, too. All right. Uh, Curtis, keep on going, because I'm going to try to bring Kel in on this. So if you can, continue while I try oh, to dial her out. And as we do this. finally got you in sweetie oh i know i could hear somebody i could hear something on the other end and then i thought oh i'll just wait she's probably just going into the green room and um block talk radio i hear thanks for using block talk radio goodbye <laughs> well you're in there baby doll all right i'm, I'm unmuting thank you thank you sweetie all right yeah you might want to 
Oh, sorry about that, Kel. Sorry, well, sorry about that, Kel. <laughs> uh, Curtis, we got Kel, and yeah. I kind of screwed her up, so <laughs> we got Kel in the right, line. Well, I was just talking about a level playing field, so let's make it make it nice and level for Kel to join in. <laughs> <laughs> Merry Christmas, Curtis and Annie. Oh, Merry How Christmas you doing, to you too. Um, it, it, of course, it's it's a holiday, so you know a Block Talk Radio is going to um, screw us up. So. <laughs> We're here. We're here. Oh, man. Um, we were doing the dedication to all those people behind the scenes that really make these holidays you know, possible for us. You think about that. If you think back maybe, say, 100 years, um, you didn't have the roadway clearance if there was a storm that we have today, the technologies and everything. You didn't have the ability to pick up your cell phone and on a dime call someone to wish them you know, a Merry Christmas or anything. The times have changed. We've taken so much for granted. And I think that's why a dedication to all those people that make these holidays possible for us to enjoy with all the conveniences. What's your say on this, Gail? Oh, well, I totally agree with that, absolutely. If we didn't have the uh, frontline workers working behind the scenes, it would just be chaos out there. I am so grateful to um, everybody from hospital staff to snow shovelers, everything. Yeah. And it really hit me as I was sitting in the hospital watching everything that was going on. And, you know, all these men and women could have opted to be at home rather than to be doing the job. Uh, they may not love the job 100 percent, but they're doing it. And some of the people when I talked to at the hospital, they said, you know, do you normally work the holidays? And they would normally would say, yeah, I do have family at home. But these people are in the hospital and they can't be home with their family. So I think it's more important that I be with them to help them so that they get better, so they can go home to their family. And I thought that was really important. You know, you think about it, first responders are doing the same thing. You know, there are a lot that don't have, you know, family at home for the holidays, so they'll say, I will volunteer so that man or woman can go to their children and be with them or be with their family for the holidays. So, you know, I'll work in their stead. And you hear this over and over again. And as Curtis was talking about the military, you know, the people that are behind the scenes to support the military, the military themselves that are out there. And it could be a holiday and they could be fighting a battle. You know, we, we, we tend to forget about these people that are in the background. And that's why I think it's so important that we do this dedication to these, these heroes. Yeah, I, I, would like, I would like to add yeah. one more group to, to the first responders and, and um, the military. And that's... Um, the people that work in um, child protective services and foster care, those people out there making sure that these children who have no no home or family, as we know in, in the traditional sense, making sure that they have a great holiday. You know, we should never forget these lost children, you know, in our daily you know lives and stuff as we, we go about our day. So I'm glad that there are people out there that are kind of like looking out for um, those kids in foster care. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure, as I'm sure some of us know somebody that's, you know, in foster care or child protective services today. And then we can go one further a step past that. Those that work for the charities that open up the soup kitchens and the shelters for the homeless, that take the time off of the yeah. holiday, rather than being at home and enjoying the, the turkey, the ham, the fixings and the gifts and the greetings and the rum punch or the eggnog that are out there doing the work of God, helping these people that are are homeless. You know, there are so many people that we could add to this dedication that during these holidays, take the time to reach out and do God's work. There's no other way to say it, but it's God's work. Whether or not they believe in God or not, I believe God has directed them, whether or not they want to admit it or not. You know, but it's these are things that I watched as I was looking at my husband lying in the hospital bed, and these things are all that went through my mind, how blessed we are as a nation that we truly do this for our fellow man. What nation does this? What other nation goes out of its way to help the least among us? And then we get kicked in the teeth for it too. But we still do it. We still do it. Well, I would say this much. Uh, I've been to different countries, and um, I would say 60% of them were poor countries. Um, in Africa, 
some in the Middle East. And uh, it's always good to come back home. That, that I can say, and it's because of um, what we have here, you know, and what we're allowed to have, and that's freedom and um, choices. And we have a chance at prosperity where most people in the world, they don't have those options, you know. They, their lives are dictated by others. And um, I think we all should, should thank the Almighty that we were born here in, in the West, you know here in the United States and Canada, places like that, and England. Mm -hmm. I think we have a better chance, you know, at being who we want to be in, in the West than we would if we were born in the East <laughs> or under some dictatorship. Oh, absolutely. Amen to that. And I'm going to finish off the dedication with this, unless Kel wants to make one last statement, and I'll, I'll do the dedication music, and then I'll go into talking about the miracle. Kel, do you have something to add? Oh, absolutely. Everybody is now familiar with uh, General James Mattis, right? Mm hmm Yeah. Wonderful. A wonderful, wonderful individual. Well, Curtis, you brought up the soldier, and yes, indeed, we have to, we must uh, think about the soldier who did not make it home for Christmas, who was deployed overseas or just cannot make it home. And there is one real leader in the military, and that is General James Mattis. And that a couple of months ago, there was a gentleman, uh, his name um, is General Kulik, the former commandant of the Marine Corps, and he's now the chair of the Naval Academy Board of Visitors. And they were having a conversation and anticipating listening to a General Mattis speak at an event. And um, General Kulik said, let me tell you a Jim Mattis story. Uh when he was a commandant of the Marine Corps every year, starting about a week before Christmas, he and his wife would bake hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Christmas cookies. They would package them in small bundles. Then on Christmas Day, he would load his vehicle at about 4 a.m. This would be General Curlett. He and his wife, they would load the vehicle at 4 a.m., and they would drive about the, to every Marine Guard post in the Washington, Annapolis, Baltimore area and deliver a small package of Christmas cookies to whoever uh, was on duty. So, he said that one year he had gone down to the Quantico, I think, Quantico, Quantico my apologies. Quantico, yeah. That, that's it. As one of his stops to deliver Christmas cookies to the Marines on guard duty there. Now, he went to the command center and gave a package to the Lance Corporal, who was on duty. He asked, who's the officer of the day? The Lance Corporal said, Sir, it's Brigadier General Mattis. And General Krulik said, No, no, no. I know who General Mattis is. I mean, who's the officer of the day today? Christmas Day. The Lance Corporal, feeling a little anxious, said, Sir, it's Brigadier General Mattis. General Krulik said that about that time he spotted in the back room a cot or a day bed. He said, No, Lance Corporal. Who slept in that bed last night? The Lance Corporal said, Sir, it was Brigadier General Mattis. About that time, General Krulak said that General Mattis came in, in a duty uniform and a sword. And General Krulak said, Jim, what are you doing here on Christmas Day? Why do you have duty? General Mattis told him that the very young officer who was scheduled to have duty on Christmas Day had a family, and General Mattis decided it was better for the young officer to spend Christmas Day with his family so he chose to have a duty on Christmas Day. And General Krulik said, that's the kind of officer that Jim Mattis is. And I thought I'd like to share that with you guys. Oh, that is absolutely wonderful. And to know that now he will serve our nation as, as on the Obama administration. Uh, not Obama. Oh, God. Oh, God. Was that a Freudian slip? <laughs> the Trump administration. <laughs> Goes to show the quality. The sign of the cross now. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> mia copa, mia copa, desa mia copa. Oh, man. So uh, following that, the dedication, I'm going to do My Name is America by Todd Allen Herndon. Today's show is dedicated to all those forgotten heroes that worked during the holidays so the rest of us may enjoy it. God bless them all. My Name is America by Todd Allen Herndon. I fought for my liberty 
I paid with the blood of my people. Freedom has never been free. Now my door's always open to dreamers and friends. But when I'm attacked, I protect and defend because my name is America. played that in a while todd allen heron did my name is america and you get it at todd check it out you're still here listening to southern sense here on block talk radio high plains media shr media kinetic hi-fi the fix fm out of charleston south carolina of course you know me as the hostess with the most just the radio chick annie and today my co-host and guest co-host is curtis c.s bennett and kill fritzy um you guys are talking about grilled cheese sandwiches and tomato soup oh god that was what my dinner was last night grilled cheese sandwich and tomato <laughs> and rice soup ah uh, oh, geez i hate eating alone jeez it's driving me crazy having him in the hospital uh which brings me around to uh kel and curtis you know what i've been going through for the last mm. uh, uh uh since the 18th um my husband uh, took a bad fall a week ago sunday uh, actually he had a seizure and he broke his hip ended up with a hip replacement and uh and I, I wrote up a little bit of a monologue. So, Kel and Curtis, feel free to jump in, uh, cut me off, or ask questions, because okay. this is several pages <coughs> long. And I just wrote it all in one sitting, so I don't know how good my grammar is or my syntax, but I just ran it through. And uh, bear with me as I read this thing I call a Christmas miracle. And I start off with, as I wrote this story, I sat in the hospital next to my husband's bed on Christmas Day. 
As he slept, I kept watch over him, amazed that our bond of love has taken on a renewed life. There are those in life who have never experienced one true long and lasting love that my husband and I share. I pity them, and I pray one day they find the someone special with whom they would never want to be parted. Also, there are those in life who have never known God's love and his miracles. For them, I have a deeper sense of pity and love. For that is the greatest love of all, one I fear to lose, for to do so, I would lose my soul. And forgive me if I can't get through this without crying. (laughs) I guess I should start at the beginning. It began a 25-year journey. It is a roller coaster, but one heck of a ride. One day, while enjoying a happy hour glass of wine, I looked up and saw a tall, slender, handsome man in a navy suit, sipping a martini. I'd seen him before, but never approached him or tried to strike up a conversation. But at that moment, I turned to my companions and said, Do you see that man? Pointing to him. I'm going to marry him one day. And of course, they thought I was nuts. But in my heart, I knew it to be true. A few weeks later, I had bought a cute shorts and jacket outfit with a tank top to coordinate with it. (laughs) It was black hot pants shorts with a bolero jacket and a burnt orange top. (laughs) Forgive me my ego, but I looked good. As I walked into the lounge one evening, heads turned my way with admiring glances. It was not the first time, but this night, it felt special, and I didn't know why. I had learned my future husband's name, pronounced Yanni. He worked a few doors down at the printing shop. But that evening, once again, he stood at the end of the bar, sipping his martini, as I sat with my friends sipping my wine. He flagged down the barmaid and pointed in my direction and went quietly back, sipping his drink. A few moments later, the barmaid came over to me with an empty shot glass, turned it upside down, placing it next to my wine glass. And she said, the gentleman at the other end of the bar would like to buy you a drink. She then added, he told me to tell you, you make the outfit. I was thrilled. I went around the bar to where he stood to thank him. And on my tippy toes, now he's six foot three to my five foot three, reaching up, I kissed him on the cheek and thanked him. Despite the fact he thought I was bold and brash, we were married two years later. Over the years, we have a generally good marriage. And like any couple experienced up and downs, the down times would not be over money, although it was often tight, but over his drinking. He was hospitalized twice after having seizures, and each time he bounced back, went clean and sober, only to fall off the wagon. I guess at times I gave in to him rather than fight. Anyone who lives with an alcoholic knows what I mean. Despite it all, he's funny, talented, charming, generous, and loving. He's never met a person who doesn't like him, nor whom he doesn't impress and like him back. It was one Christmas morning a few years past. His sister passed away from cirrhosis. It was enough to scare him straight for a while. As I said, for a while. And then it was back again down that road until he had his first seizure and ended up in the emergency room awaiting life-saving surgery to stop the bleeding. We were sent to a specialist about a possible liver transplant. He looked at his medical record and told him he had six months to live. Yanni walked out of the doctor's office and looked at me and said, Oh, hell no, and he never went back to him. Once again, he went on the wagon, and he was good, until months later, the wagon slipped out from under him. Fast forward a few years, and he suffers another seizure. Only this one is more spectacular than the last one. Once again, he was scared straight for a while. Then we went back down the rabbit hole. Now I'm no angel. While I encourage him to either abstain or at least to use some discipline to limit his intake, I was no shining example. I do enjoy a few glasses at night, but will never do a 24-hour binge, much less a 12-hour or even a 6-hour hand over fist intake. I thought I knew all of his hiding places when I found him. He would ask that I allow him a shot when he gets what he calls the shaky bakies, which is important to prevent another seizure. Withdrawals, if not handled correctly, can cause severe seizures and even death. It was one week ago, just before Christmas, a Sunday, 
we went to church. We arose and dressed. I didn't see him take a drink, nor ask me for a shot to calm his nerves. And as we left for church, I didn't smell alcohol on him as we kissed, nor did he seem tipsy. After church, he suggested we stop for brunch, which we did. We arrived at the restaurant just blocks from our home. Everything seemed great as we sat down and ordered. Now here, the bells and whistles should have gone off of me, but they didn't. I ordered the buffet. He ordered a scotch. No food on the side. Two more scotches later, I suggested we head home, which we did. As we walked through the restaurant, his steps seemed to be more and more unsteady. We proceeded out to the sidewalk towards the per- parking lot. Concerned, I tried to hold his elbow to steady him. It didn't make sense. There were only three drinks. He shouldn't seem in- extremely intoxicated. With his history, no way would three drinks make him drunk. Or so I thought. I was wrong. We reached the car. I got in the driver's side, keeping an eye on him as he opened the passenger door. It was only two seconds. Two seconds I looked away to turn the key in the ignition. I looked over again. He was gone. I jumped out of the SUV. I ran around to where I saw him, and he was crumpled on the ground. Tried to help him up. One would have better luck trying to hold on to jello cubes in your bare hands in an earthquake. God has mysterious ways of helping, guiding, and teaching. Within a minute, a couple pulled into the parking lot and saw our predicament. They stopped and tried to help, but he couldn't stand up because his leg wouldn't bear his weight. He was in great pain. Our good Samaritan dialed 911 and handed me his cell phone. Help was on its way with the EMS ambulance. Off we went to the emergency room with deep thanks to our friends. The end result is that his hip is broken. He had suffered another seizure. It was determined he needed a partial joint replacement. If he failed to do so, his life expectancy would have been down to weeks because of the complications that would have occurred from the broken joint in his bed confinement. The next evening he had the surgery, and while the joint replacement was great, other complications popped up. And for a day and a half, the staff worked to stabilize him. Now he started to go critical. At 3 a.m., I got a call from the hospital. He was moved to the ICU, the intensive care unit. This was Wednesday morning. Come Friday morning, it slipped further and further down that slippery slope, and the attending ICU doctor pulled me aside. He was on a ventilator and had already four blood transfusions. If he failed to respond soon, all that I have done... The next step would have been a respirator. Once he went on the respirator, he will be on it for the rest of his life, locked in a bed. But it would be a very short life. Now here is where we may face controversy and debate. End of life choices. When do we say enough is enough of trying to save me? What are our wishes and quality of life choices? Fortunately, he and I had this conversation and each of us had a health care proxy and living will done three years before. Neither of us wanted to be kept alive with extreme measures where we would be no better than vegetables or purely dependent upon machines to sustain our being. My father made that choice a few years back. After having his heart attack and being brought back twice, he did not have a living will or health care proxy. For several days, he laid in cardiac intensive care, and we finally got the hospital to give us the necessary paperwork for him to sign. We explained it to Dad, and he asked, what's the bottom line? And I said, Dad, if you have another attack, do you want to be paddled again back to life? In one of the few times he ever raised his voice to me or any of us in the room, he shouted out loud, no. Well, Yanni and I were together as we watched the anguish in his face as he answered. We both understood what he meant. Sometimes man should not do the business of God, but rather let God work through man. Now I stood with the ICU doctor, one who I came to know in such a short time as a caring person, a lovely lady of good Christian values for sanctity of life. For many of the choices may be sugar-coated so they can handle the hard choices, but for me, give me the bottom line and don't hold back any of the facts. I sat with my husband now for five days at his side. I watched him deteriorate before my eyes, where he became incoherent and confused. His liver was no longer filtering out the poisons, even if we put him on the respirator. 
His life will fail, and we only would have bought a little time with him trapped in a living hell. How could I let the man I love go? What type of wife am I to give up and let him go? I can't let him go. What would my life be without him in it? What would happen to me? We're supposed to have many years together. No, this can't happen. These thoughts circled around me. My face cannot hide my emotions, and the doctor watched carefully as she gauged her next words. She said, Do you understand what I'm telling you? Please give me the bottom line and all the facts so I can weigh them, I asked. I need all you can tell me so I can make an informed decision. A glimmer came to her eyes and she understood that despite my emotional turmoil, I was reacting with calmness and logic while I was really dying inside. We discussed the options, the percentages, and the reality of this situation. There was a 12-hour window that if he didn't turn around in that time frame, it would be the respirator a really living hell for him, or to let him go naturally, a living hell for me. His health care proxy in living will said, let him go. But as his proxy, I could override it if I wanted. It was a little after 10 a.m., and 12 hours were counting down fast. I needed to go home to feed the cats and left, crying all the way home. As I drove home, I was asking What am I to do? Who will drive me to the doctor or the hospital when I have my next procedure? Who will finish all the home improvement projects? What will I do with all these tools and clothes? But wait, he's not dead yet. What the heck am I thinking? I loved him with all my heart. Why was I thinking these things? And then I realized it was a defensive mechanism, a way to protect my heart, which was breaking apart. I went back to his room that afternoon with tears streaming down my face. He always pulled the rabbit out of the hat and was always okay. He is my rack, despite all his faults. He's my one true love. I am lost without him. What would I do without him? These questions and more ran around my head and heart. I sat next to his bed, calling on God to help me and him. Then I realized... I was praying for the wrong thing. I was being selfish. I was praying for myself and not what was important. What was important? What was important was my husband and God. My heart was closing. It was not good. I sat back in the chair as reality hit me squarely in the face. How arrogant. How selfish was I. How idiotic for me to presume. This was about me. My head draped over the back of the stiff chair. I closed my eyes. And before me, in my eyes, was the painting by William Holman Hunt called The Light of the World. It's my all-time favorite painting. I saw the painting in my mind's eye. Christ, standing before a door with no doorknob on the outside. It is covered with vines and obscured by weeds. In his left hand is a lit lantern, as his right hand is raised to knock upon the door. A dim light shines outward from the door, as a crown of thorns adorns our Lord's head. I am that person behind the door. I am that person who hasn't allowed Christ to fully enter my heart. If I so selfishly thought of only myself, it's not about me. It never was. I needed to do a reevaluation. I took in the painting and I pulled at the inside of the door handle. I pulled hard, inch by inch. I pried the door open and let Christ back into my heart. Every time my mind went back over to, oh, woe is me, it started to pull closed. I fought back and pulled open further. Christ stood before me, patient and waiting. I am still fighting the inner toima. But a calmness came over me as I prayed for my husband's recovery and trust in God's choice. I realized something important. To trust in God, even if my husband should not make it, 
It is God's will. He has a purpose which I need to trust in. That doesn't mean we shouldn't fight for survival. No, it means we fight the good fight as hard as we can. If we lose, then accept it and move on to the next fight with even more faith. Meanwhile, word began to spread among family and friends about my husband's illness and hospitalization. I only told a few people, but one can never keep anything secret in today's day and age. Prayers came in from around the globe, from Canada, the Caribbean, of course, America and Europe, from places and people I never heard from. I sat back in that stiff chair, my back aching, my friend, a deacon from my church, who has been a friend of mine for years before his ordination, came into the room. I poured my heart out. I spoke about the hunt painting and my shameful thoughts and my epiphany of God's will and acceptance. And as we sat there, we were watching him slip quietly away from us. But life must go on. We have six cats at home when we needed feeding and the boxes needed to scoop out. I headed home for a few hours. After four, I returned. I returned to his bedside only to be surprised. The CPAP mask that was keeping oxygen going into him was off. He was breathing on his own. His blood pressure and heart rate was nearing normal. His color was picking up. Yet a few mere hours ago, I was worrying that I would be a widow at only 57 years of age. My friend, the attending doctor, was amazed. No one expected this turn of events. Everyone was amazed. No one saw such a turnaround. How could such a thing happen? But only one answer. It was a Christmas miracle. Prayers, prayers, and more prayers were lifted up to the Lord. I had my husband back for now. I turned my thoughts away from myself and into the Lord and my husband. I shed my selfishness and gained the most wonderful Christmas gift of all gifts. I still can't stop grinning from ear to ear. But oh, the story is not over yet. He has a long road to travel, and yes, he can still use your prayers. It will be another six months or more before his hip is healed enough. It will also be another long, hard road for his other weakness. But this time, here's a reason to stay the path. With your love, prayers, and friendships, he'll make it. And I will add something further today. Over the last two days, it was very hard to get him up to do his physical therapy. And he had stopped eating. He's malnourished. And I had a talk with him last night. I went home again in tears, saying he gave up. But I had a few more days with him. And then today, when I went back this morning, he ate dinner last night. And he was eating breakfast this morning. He got up, and he did something that he had never done before. He got out of bed with help of two physical therapists. He walked the length of the room and out into the hallway. And I stood there smiling and grinning that stupid grin of mine again, tears streaming down my face. And the physical therapists were looking at me as I was praying and thanking God for these miracles he's given me. It's been a very difficult Christmas, yes. I spent it alone or at his bedside. But it's a gift, a Christmas I shall never forget, with some of the greatest gifts possible in the love that I felt. And I want to thank all of you that have given prayers. And I thank my friends, Kel, and Curtis that have been at my side the entire time. Kel, who has sat on the phone with me for more than an hour or so, just listening and talking. And I thank you all. I'm going to say God bless you all. And Kel, you better take over because I've got to blow my nose real bad. <laughs> <laughs> Annie, my goodness, how beautifully written is that. And thank you so much for sharing that. And yeah, folks, <laughs> it is a miracle indeed. And um, when I was speaking with Annie over the course of the last uh, week or so, getting updates and uh, yelling at Annie through the phone, hey you. <laughs> when Annie called me though, that um, Yanni had taken a turn for the worse, I burst into tears. But then Annie called me the next day and said, look, things are improving, and I burst into tears. Those hot tears that roll down your face, the tears of grief and the tears of joy, I experienced both. And I am grateful to um, Annie's friends 
and family out there that sent up prayers because the power of prayer really did work through. And it sounds like Yanni's going to be home pretty soon, Annie. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. I'm, I'm hoping I'm praying for before I'm, the New Year's, but it's going to depend upon how quickly. And now if he, he looked like he was ready to try to start running down the hall, but, you know, it, he needed two <laughs> people to help him stand up. So it's going to be a while because I can't lift him, unfortunately, because, you know, you know, I don't talk about myself very often. Uh, and This is, I think, the first time I ever gave anything in depth. I was saying, you know, saying that I'm handicapped, that's it, that we'll go on from that. So I can't lift him. It would be difficult. So they've got to get him strong enough so that he can push himself mm. off the bed or off the chair on his own. And then I can help him with the walker mm. and getting in and out, you know, to the point where I can help him. So I'm praying one week, you know, if he heals, starts, you know, doing everything they tell him to do, eating what he's supposed to eat. Uh, he wanted to come home this afternoon, and I says, "Honey, how can I lift you? How can I do anything for you? you know, I can't even get him into the shower." So you know, it's uh, it's going to be a long road back. So I'm hoping within one max two weeks we have him home. So, uh, gosh, <laughs> thanks guys for letting me <laughs> act like a fool. I like to I like to say that was one powerful testimony. And it, it goes to show that there, there are miracles if only we believe. And it also shows um, the power of love. And when you have someone who isn't really doing what they need to do to stay healthy, you don't abandon them. You try to work with them, even though they may struggle in their quest to, to do the right thing. But we can never give up on them. And I think that's where love comes in. And uh, then, you know, down the line, hopefully you have an outcome that we can call a miracle. There's a lot of people who struggle in a day with uh, husbands and, and whatnot or wives who are going through, I would say, um, you know, old age. Uh, they're very forgetful. Uh, they have seizures or whatever. And, and they're up in age, and it's hard for that one spouse, especially if it's a female, to deal with a husband that like weighs like 50 more pounds than she does. Right. Well, Cal, but, um, can you, you know, Curtis, you know, Alzheimer's right. and, Curtis and Cal, can you take over for a second? Because this is Yanni on the phone. Hang on. <laughs> okay. Oh, absolutely. So, you know, we, we have to stay vigilant, you know, in our, our relationships and marriages um, with the the people who profess to love. And like I said, even when things aren't going right, you know, we have to be there. And Andy gave us a prime example of what can happen if we stay course and if we, we, you know, demonstrate that love. You know, a lot of people say, you know, they love you. Do they really love you? You know, have they demonstrated that they love you? You know, you have a lot of friends that say, yeah, I love you. So are they around when you need that love, you know? So, you know, when the times get rough. So I, like I said, Annie's te testament today was uh, a fine example of um, what love and, and miracles can do in our lives. Well, what do that, you think, Karen? That, that was Yanni on the phone. I he agree with everything Curtis said. <laughs> that was Yanni on the phone just calling to say, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> he must have known we were talking about it. Yeah. <laughs> God bless him. <laughs> he forgot we had the radio show today. <laughs> oh. <Bless you. laughs> and I got to tell you, the other thing that's going on is I got a six-month-old kitten. She sees my hand wagging, it, wagging as I'm talking. She's attacking my hand. <laughs> so if you is that hear, baby? That's baby. That's baby. <laughs> She's watching my <laughs> baby. <laughs> Oh, man. I'm going to send her a Justin Bieber song. Baby, baby, baby. Oh, no, no. If you do that, you you, you will no longer be my fan. Do not send me anything, Justin I know. Bieber. I'm going to be so totally thrown off your Christmas <laughs> list. I know. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, jeez. But, you know, this has been a very, very strange Christmas season, I must say. Oh, man. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> And I, I want to thank Absolutely. everyone that's up in the chat room, you know, Rock and Ron and Hope and Moving and uh, Vita Mamma Mia uh, for all your kind words. Yes, it, it was not easy. And 
you know, I am a very private individual. Kel knows that. I don't let a lot of things out about myself, you know, just the barest details. But uh, I felt that, you know, this was something that I needed to share. And, you know, let people know there is hope. As long as you have people that love you and you have faith, uh, I think we can get through just about anything. And look at look at we survived eight years of Obama. That should be a testimony enough. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> we got faith. We got hope. And Kel, how many more Man, years do you have? Right how many more years of the shiny pony do you have up there? <laughs> oh, you won't believe what he's up to now. I don't even know if he's I a, want to um, take away Justin Trudeau. Oh. <laughs> Thank God. I posted something on my Facebook page, uh, one of the uh, group pages I belong to. It's uh, Say No to Justin Trudeau. It's a group page. And I posted an article, and there's already over 150 comments, 140 reactions, and 48 shares because of what this guy is up to. <laughs> you know what he's doing now, guys? What's that? He is going to all of these Islamic events. Uh, they have some sort of a three-day conference going on in Toronto, these Muslims, and uh, diversity of faith or whatever, so whatever it is they get up to with these events. Anyway, uh, he attended uh, one of these events, and he was encouraging Muslims to join opposition parties, any party, all parties, conservative, NDP, liberal, Green Party, whatever. Just get out there, become political, join a party so that nobody can defeat you. What? Yeah. <laughs> so who is he truly representing? The Islamic like, State no of way. Canada? Islamic State of Canada. <laughs> Cal, There's I still already have... an Islamic Party of Canada, apparently. <laughs> well, I still have that spare room down here, Cal, for you. <laughs> He's got this solidarity thing all screwed up. <laughs> oh, does he, does he ever... Oh... He, he's he's just unbelievable. He, uh, people were saying that he's Obama Jr. No, 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 folks. He is Obama on steroids. He had this interview with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, and he said Canada is benefiting from welcoming in people who are so deeply committed to living up to the opportunities given to them. Sounds really nice, right? But what he uh, says uh, in the next breath is that I think that... Um, uh, we should encourage Muslims to um, uh, join all parties, and quote, to make sure that no party gets to run against Muslim Canadians or any other group of Canadians and demonize them. We, what is this, code speak for uh, get the armies up and running people? I'm just, no, like I say, I don't. we don't know what to do with this guy. Kel, you just said something that, that caught my ear. They said, you should join the opposition party so no one can run against you. Now, you take that back a step and think about what Loretta Lynch and Justin Trudeau were doing when they were saying that you cannot criticize Islam or Muhammad. So in other words, if you were to mm -hmm. run against them for political office, then you are then going to criticize Islam or put down Muhammad because you don't want a Muslim to run for office. You know, this is code speak for saying that if you are a Muslim, then no one can run against you and the Muslim must win. Exactly. That's part of it. Or, uh, in a more, you know, I don't know, hopeful scenario, if you lose your writing in Thornhill, you can pick it up in Guelph. But Justin Trudeau is actively encouraging a political participation of Muslims in Canada. He is speaking specifically to Muslims and encouraging them to garner representatives for whatever political party. It is very frightening what this person is doing to our country. Very now, frightening. Instead and that's of exactly it, Annie. Yeah, instead of yeah. encouraging all Canadian citizens to become involved in the political process, he's sex he's selecting a specific section of your society, specifically a geopolitical um, re semi-religious organization, setting aside a special class for this section of your society above all others. Now, I don't know what your Canadian constitution reads, but is that constitutional? You know what? 
I'm not even going to try to answer that because I don't know how it would fit into the Constitution, to be quite frank. Mm. But there is a lot of sentiment out there that he is acting traitorous. And this is why we want the Governor General to remove him, because we do think that he is a traitor to the country. But the thing is, is that it's under the veneer of uh, he's staying just inside the line, just inside. We know that he's violating a Canadian principles, values. We know that, uh, of course, he is capable of creating a dissension, just like uh, Barack Hussein Obama did there in the United States, in which he is doing. He is dividing Canada. We know he's a danger. We know that he is not looking out for the best interests of Canadians. We know that he is destroying the social fabric of the country, but he's just so inside the radar that I don't even know if he could be challenged constitutionally. I suppose that's what I should say. Mm. Well, how much time do you have to put up with this guy? Our next general election is 2020. Mm. Oh, my God. Another three years. Wow. Three years. Oh, Lord. And he's... It's it's not only so much, too, that he is obviously a panderer uh, to the uh, Muslims in Canada. He's uh, bringing in more and more Syrian refugees. He He wants many, many, many more refugees. He said, we can't adapt them, but we can trust them. Like, this guy is... Well, he's exactly what we call him, a shiny pony. He's a tater tot. Every time he opens his mouth, something really stupid falls out of it. This is how his mind works. You see, the thing is, he doesn't have very good handlers. Justin Trudeau, if the handlers walk out of the room, he runs out of the other door. Look at me, look at me. And he just comes out with the most outrageous things, and that was one of them. Oh, well, you know, we, we can't vet these migrants. So we're seeing what's happening in Europe with the uh, the Muslim male migrants. Yeah, yeah, but it's Canada. It's different. We can trust We can trust them. But this guy has absolutely no coherency whatsoever. He's not concerned about the uh, security of the country. He is fast-tracking these migrants, too. This is another thing is that when you emigrate to Canada, there's a certain waiting period you have to go through before you can even apply for landed status. And that is uh, the uh, paved way to obtaining full Canadian citizenship. It takes, it's it's quite a process. And Justin Trudeau, though, he is uh, vetoing that in that he is granting landed status to these migrants before their feet even touch the tarmac which means that in two years they can be full-blown Canadians, guess what, just in time to vote in the next general election. Oh, man. You guys are in for it. You are really in for it. This is what we put up with with eight years with President Obama, the fast-tracking, the DARPA, everything else he was doing. And we've got, uh, what is it, today is today's the 27th? Yeah. We've got uh, 20, 24 days before we can turn the corner and have a Trump in here. And let's see how many of these executive orders and other things that he can knock off the books. And uh, there's going to be a lot of brouhaha going on over here. And Vito's over in the chat room. I'm sure he's going to agree with me that there is going to be one heck of a turmoil. I mean, moving in golf also, hope. You know, we're going to see <laughs> the mass mo- media going mass hysterical. And we're going to be enjoying it. Because things are going to finally get done. Holy moly. This is things we're going to talk with Rodney, Rodney Lee Conover as soon as he calls in. He should be calling in in another couple of minutes here. I talked with the his his handler last night and assured me that uh, Rodney will be calling in shortly. And we do have a caller coming in. And let me bring this person in on the line. And Hello, this is Southern Sense. I was looking for Mrs. Watson. No, you have a wrong number, unless you're trying to call Southern Sense. Nope, I have the wrong number. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't know Skype did that. <laughs> That's the first time I had a call coming in on Skype while I was on air. <laughs> so, Okay, I should have had you become Miss, Mrs. Watson, Kel. He calls back, you're Mrs. Watson. How's that? Did I lose Kel? 
did I did I lose? Do I, am I on the air? Hi there. We on the air? Did I get caught, kicked off? We got you back. Ah, you got me back. A Skype call came in and knocked me off. It was the first time I had that ha- happen. Hmm. Weird. He was looking for <laughs> Mrs. Watson. <laughs> You're not Mrs. Watson, oh, are you, Cal? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Folks, this is live radio. You never know what's going to happen. <laughs> and that was the call in, huh? No, it was not our caller. It was not a call in. Besides, even if it was the caller, I have no idea how to bring the person in from Skype onto BTR. <laughs> so I don't even know why I answered. She let it go. Really. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, while, while you guys are waiting for your guest, can I just share something very, very quick? And uh, this is courtesy of George Sinser, by the way, of Firefox News Online. He's brilliant. Well, I'm brilliant because both our minds were working in uh, tandem yesterday for sure. We were talking about this on the uh, RFB show. We were talking about the inauguration of uh, Donald Trump, and I said that for the longest time, it's been tradition for a newly minted American president. His first foreign visit as president has always been to Canada. And I said, I don't know what Justin Trudeau will do. He'll he'll be shaking like a leaf. His head will explode. He won't know what to do with Donald Trump. And George said, and I was nearly going to say it at the same time, George said, you know what? His first state visit should be to Israel. Uh, oh, applause, yes. Applause, applause. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Now, I wouldn't that be something? I would completely agree with that. That is such a great idea. You know, I, I that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure someone has already said that to him. I am pretty sure, especially with the brouhaha that's going on over there now with Obozo orchestrating yep. that U.N. resolution. And if Obozo says he oh, didn't orchestrate it, gosh. he's full of BS. You know, the Israelis have the evidence. They have the evidence down to everything so as soon as they they put it all together they're going to hand it over to trump and let trump run with it and if that is the case i'm wondering if this is worth the criminal prosecution that would be a very good question so depending, yeah depending upon how it was done and what was done whether or not it would be worthy of a criminal prosecution i don't know maybe Vito or moving knows a little bit more about that um Ah, moving says Trump will close the border to Canada until free speech returns. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> uh, I know I read this joke on the last show, but I'm going to say, read it again because there's a bunch of people listening in that haven't heard this one before. But uh, someone sent this to me back on the 21st, a friend of mine locally, what a member of my tea party, believe it or not. And this is called the first presidential Trump joke. And it goes like this. A large earthquake with the strength of 8.1 on the Richter scale hit the Middle East. Two million Muslims died and over a million more were injured. Iraq, Iran and Syria were totally ruined and the governments asked for help to rebuild. The rest of the world was in shock. Great Britain sent troops to help with the peace. Saudi Arabia sent oil and monetary assistance. Latin American countries sent clothing. New Zealand and Australia sent sheep cattle and food crops. The Asian countries sent labor to assist in rebuilding the infrastructure. Canada sent medical teams and supplies. The new American president, Donald Trump, not to be outdone. What did he send? He sent two million replacement Muslims. God bless President Trump. What a great guy to do something like this. (laughs) I love it. Oh, where's the applause button for that? (laughs) <laughs> oh i love that i absolutely love that oh man We're, we've got the phone lines open so in case anyone wants to call in and join the conversation i'm just hoping nothing happened to rodney because he did confirm it last night so he's probably just a little slow in the uptake today you know maybe a little too much eggnog there rodney <laughs> but we got plenty to talk about um did you catch this yeah Th- that um uh, Trump is closing down his charities. He's not closing it down. He is suspending oh, yeah. activity. 
while they're still doing this investigation. Um, so now at this point, uh, Eric Trump had raised through this charity. Where is the number? Uh, uh, I'm looking for this. There was a figure here. And I can't seem to... Uh, here it goes. $15 million. Raised $15 million for St. Jude's Children's Hospital. And he's been doing this since he was 21 years old. That's a heck of a lot of money. And they're forcing this charity to shut down. Can you imagine St. Jude's Ch- Hospital losing this source of, of donations? And how many other charities are going to lose it because the Trump Foundation, because the New York State Attorney General has a hard-on for Trump? And yes, folks, I did say that. Isn't that unbelievable? Hmm. Yeah. And uh, let's see. Everything he does. Yeah. Unbelievable, Annie and Curtis. Man. Now, I'm trying to read what Move and Head wrote. He goes, the new agenda is fair trade, free speech, and F. Mohammed Dunn's. Oh, okay. New World, I got you. The (laughs) most. Okay, now I got you. I was trying to figure out what it was. I had to send it out. Doi, doi. I never said I was the sharpest knife in the in the in the box. And right now I got a twenty pound cat trying to climb on my lap, and I don't need your claws. (laughs) Well, Amy, what do you you think about all these groups that um, refuse to um, play for the inauguration balls and whatnot? I mean. Is that anti-American or what? Now, I, I don't know the name of the uh, female opera that's going to sing the national anthem. Uh, I saw it. Did I did I print that out? That was one of the articles I was looking at. Uh, just bear with me for a second because I think I, I did print that out last night. Uh, this young lady, I had never heard of her before. And uh, tell me I don't have it. Oh, no. No, I didn't do that. No, I didn't. Uh, this young la- young lady who uh, seems to be an up-and-coming opera star, she's been singing, she's got several albums out, she said yes to singing the national anthem, and within 24 hours, all of her albums, even the ones she's done several years ago, have tripled in sales in just 24 hours. So whoever doesn't want to sing or perform for Trump, they're going to see their sales and everything go down. Watch their box office numbers go down. So you want to shoot yourself in the foot and you think you're, you're, you're having your say and say, oh, the, the left didn't get it. The New World Order can't have its place. You know, we're not going to get Hillary. We're not going to get, you know, all this and that. You know, Hillary should have won. Uh-uh. Trump won. Face it, flounder. Grow up. Have a choir. And I heard that the Mormon medical choir was going to perform, too. Good. Good. Yeah. Because for every last performer that goes out there for the Trump inauguration, they're going to see their support from the average American that was out there and voted. The people that spend the money on Netflix, that go out to, uh, I don't know, big lots and buys their cassettes or whatever it is. Whoever goes online to Amazon or to all those other sites and buys the stuff, that's where the voice speaks. Money walks Money talks, bullshit walks. That's the bottom line. Yeah. You know, and, and people who decline, too, they are going to suffer for this. And uh, Hope has been uh, putting in some great stuff in the chat room, and she said that uh, Garth Brooks and Andrea Baselli, hey, they have declined to perform at the inauguration. Mm-hmm. And this makes me just want to go upstairs and take the very one CD of Garth Brooks that I have and toss it in the trash now. See, I don't even know if I have one, but he's got a new album out that he's been pushing, and he's been advertising it hot and heavy, and now I'm willing to say, hey, listen, you better put those those ads back up on the shelf, because you're not going to sell a damn thing, because you turned around and said no to Trump. And I'm not saying that it was wrong to say no to Trump, but if you want to look for which side of your bread is buttered, where your money is coming from, mm. your money is coming from conservative Christian America. It is not coming from the liberal atheist left. Garth Brook, your your yes, records sir. are sold to those in the Bible Belt and the Rust Belt, the average American that is conservative at heart, that is Christian in their faith, or the uh, Judeo-Christian. That is where your money comes from. You want to shoot yourself in the foot? Go ahead. But if you turn around and you diss your fans, then you pay the consequence. 
That's what capitalism is about. That's why free market works. Yeah. And as I said, money talks, bullshit walks. Hey, Annie, what, yes, what about that um, good old gun control that got going over there in Chicago? How did that work out this weekend with 41 shot? I heard as high as 61 and 11 killed. Oh, wow. Worse? You know what's worse? We've talked about this, the uh, gun grab on veterans, veterans with disabilities and everything else. They're going after the veterans and their guns. Yeah. Guess what Obama did? In this past week, no one's talking about this, and I'm going to have Larry Pratt hopefully on uh, next month talking about this. President Obozo, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Obama, um, has <laughs> signed on a rider to that bill that is confiscating weapons from the veterans. And now anyone on Social Security disability, if you own a gun, like me, you will face having your guns confiscated. If they deemed you physically unfit or mentally unfit to own or possess a firearm, they're coming after you. They're coming after me. And we talked about this, Curtis, and you can attest to it. We've talked about this with Larry Pratt. We've talked about this with Michael Conley. We've talked about this for the last two years. They've gone for the veterans. The next step are those on Social Security. He's done it already. Mm. Now, what we have to do is we have to... uh, 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 mobilize all of those of us on the right and start getting our elected officials to force that down. We force it down for senior citizens and we force it down for veterans. Both of them are unfair, unconstitutional, and illegal. Is this an executive order or a bill he put forth? No, it's not a bill, and I believe it's a rider onto some regulation which makes it very okay. difficult. So this is what we have to do, and this is where President Obama is going to become, uh, not Obama, oh God, I, I got to get that out of my head. Uh, geez, President Trump will be instrumental when he <laughs> does going after the agencies and their regulations. This is a regulation and a rule that we must have overturned. Next, and how I about you guys? Well, I, I'll tell you this. Since we're still waiting for uh, Rodney Lee to call over, how about you and Curtis interview me, and then we'll do it that way so we fill time until <laughs> Rodney comes in and calls in. Oh, how did you get started in radio? Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question, Curtis. Yeah, Annie, how, how did you get started in radio? Well, this goes back to my husband, Yanni. <laughs> um, <laughs> We we have a, a friend of ours, and please, no disrespect, but we call him our lovable coon ass. Um, he's from Louisiana, but was he was working for the Naval Station, the, the Marine Corps stations over here. Uh, and the two of them were having a, a one or two libations, and they were in the garage and talking slap. And they were listening to music. Um, I think it was blues or country. And, Oh, sorry, I got a cat's claw in my leg. Uh, they were listening to blues and country in the garage, and they're talking smack down with each other. And then they came up with this idea: Hey, why don't we have our own blues and country radio show? You know, we can. Th- Annie listens to this blog talk radio and stuff. You know, why don't we see? You know, if she can do something for us. And I said, Oh well, you know. And I did a little research and something about royalties and everything else. And I, over a number of weeks, I kind of like was like. Mm, looking to see whether or not we can do it or can't, can, can't. And my husband, Yanni, came up with the name Southern Sense because we live here in the South. And I said, all right, fine. Let me see what we can put together. And, of course, you know, our other friend, you know, he works during the day, so he can't do the radio show. It came down to Yanni and I doing it. So we went on. Oh, gosh, uh, this is, I think it was June or July of 2010. And Yanni and I started to just have a conversation, playing some music, clanning around. And believe it or not, our first show was talking about flatulence. Does anyone know what flatulence is? You know? Um, yeah. Can, 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 can you what, bottle that and uh, turn it into ethanol? Huh? Is that uh, it? Yeah. It's methane well, gas. <laughs> <laughs> methane gas does flow from the... <laughs> from thousands of humans. <laughs> so our first Darn. show was all about farts and it was hysterical but unfortunately uh i accidentally deleted it 
Whoops. <laughs> but we started doing this, and we would have, like, you know, comical news of the day or something like that, the most unusual, the stupidest thing of the day. And we had some, you know, funny little things we would do. But we found that people were calling in, and they were asking serious questions, serious political questions. And the majority of them were conservative questions. And then, of course, you know, my husband trying to clown around went, Mm, a little flat. Uh, people didn't understand his humor. And then I started talking to people and answering the questions and started reading news articles and just started off half an hour and then it went to an hour and then eventually an hour and a half to now the two hour show that we have. I went through a series of different co hosts and Cool Mike still calls in and, you know, Kel, you and uh, Dan were doing it with me for a while. Now Curtis has been with me for a couple of years. Uh, so it just kind of morphed on its own. Never did this before. Um, I did theater. I used to do, you know, theater stage and stuff like that, but never mm. did anything like this before. So it was a whole new venture. And that's how it came to be. Wow. Well, you're a Cal, damned good writer, you, too. <laughs> you, you got the next question, Cal. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm just going to add to what Addie said about uh, being on the airwaves uh, um, when, when I started that blog talk radio show. I, I was I was a listener, of course. Um, I think the very first show I ever listened to on blog talk radio actually, actually was Holger, Holger Awakens. And I thought, wow, this guy's really cool. You know, there are other shows like that out there. And then I was finding out that, yeah, there's a whole lot of shows out there. And I started listening to uh, Global Patriot Radio with um, Alan Vito. And I thought, oh, these guys are really cool, too. Wow. And then I started listening to uh, shows like Southern Sense. I thought, oh, wow, these guys are really awesome. And it inspired me. I thought, hey, I can do this. Well, no, I couldn't. Not by a long shot. You guys make it look so easy, but folks, it is really, really difficult. It is so hard. I struggled for the longest time, and I can barely even stand on the shoulders of the likes of Annie and Vito and Holger. <laughs> you guys are just amazing. Best community journalism, real media going on right here. I, I just adore you guys. I admire you guys. Curtis, you as well. You make it look so easy. My goodness, you guys. You would, like I say, though, you you do inspire me. <laughs> well, that's a that, <laughs> that's a nice compliment. Uh, but I'm sure Vito and everyone else can say, you know, it's 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 the homework you do. It's it you make sure you do your homework. And if you don't know, and somebody asks a question, be willing to say. I don't know, but I will find out. Or if you are wrong about uh-huh. something, say, hey, wait a minute, thank you for correcting me. I stand corrected. Never get upset. Never get angry about someone correcting you. And never get angry or upset with someone saying, all right, well, you forgot about this or that. No, it's it's an inclusive conversation because this is an unformatted uh, m- medium. It makes it flexible. Yeah. And, you know, some people keep it very stiff. They have their script and they stick to it. Or they have their monologue and they stick to it. Um, I think this is the first time I've ever really done a monologue um, that was not a dedication. And uh, Oh, man, yeah. You, you know what you say about when you are on the airwaves with people? You're right. Because if I... Uh, state something and it turns out to be a falsehood. I want people there to say, oh no, you mean such and such, don't you? Oh yes, thank, and yes, thank you. And, and and being diplomatic though can be very difficult some days, folks, hmm? when you get trolls on there. But I've had people I call into the, one of the, you know, the, uh, any given radio show and they start out, well, as trolls and they, they want to just disrupt the show. And I've had, actually had trolls call back in saying, you know what, you're the nicest lady. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm get off your. I'm going, get off my phone, you dummy. <laughs> uh, uh, but Vito says, you know, he said spot on, a lot of work goes in it, but it's interesting topic. Just make it conversational, which is true. Yeah. You know, um, I, I, Curtis has been in my little studio as cramped as is, I'm surprised the three of us fit in here. I'm talking about Curtis, me, and the cats. <laughs> but, 
But I have a basic outline, you know, things or topics I want to hit, and then I've got my print out of the articles that I can refer to. But, you know, the, the thing is that you've got to yeah, remember... I'm just it, <laughs> yeah, uh, but the thing you have to remember is that you don't use just one source. Fact check, fact check, fact check. Because a lot of times someone will send me something, um, and I'll look at it, and I'll say, right, fine, this sounds interesting, but let me double check this. And you'll end up finding, you, you do a little fact check, and mm, maybe this was a spoof article. Uh, I had someone actually try to debate me using an article off The Onion. Hello? Back in the uh, 60s and 70s, The Onions was a spoof, spoof newspaper. If you can't figure out after 50 friggin' years that this is a satire newspaper, then you do not belong in the conversation. You know, but that's what you have to do. You know, just make sure you've got your facts, multiple sources that you couldn't say, all right, fine, no, it came out of this, it came out of that, and you can check here, check there. These are the facts and figures. If you've got something different, uh, tell me and show me. Oh, you know what? That reminds me uh, of a story. This is going back uh, uh, quite a few years. Uh, I am, or was a semi. Well, when I was uh, joining Jeff over there at uh, EDL Radio, I think that he had just started the paddle show, and so there would there would be four of us on the air. And I think it was Jeff's birthday, and we totally set him up. We really <laughs> put the mickey to him. We sent him an article in all seriousness. Jeff, you've got to relate this. This is a very serious story. I can't remember what it was about. It wasn't anything, you know, earth-shattering or anything like that. But we sent him an article from The Onion, and he's reading it on the air in all seriousness. <laughs> he can't figure out why we're all laughing in the background. <laughs> well, Vito loves the way you handle trolls, uh, Kel. And um, the comments are going so fast in the in the chat room. I really can't keep up with them. So forgive me if I skip over some of you guys. But you know, Golf Dog and Smokey are having fun, and so is Moving. Moving's calling me Pocahontas. Is that what I saw there? Let me scroll back up. I, I, I. I oh, Pocahontas Annie is in the Oakley disguise. <laughs> Okay. I, mean, I, I have an interesting question for you. Okay. If you had a choice, if you had an opportunity to interview the Pope or Rush Limbaugh, which one would you interview and Rush why? Rush Limbaugh. Rush Limbaugh. I'd rather talk to a fellow conservative than a communist. Sorry, I may have upset a bunch of Catholics, <laughs> but I was born, oh, no, raised, you're baptized, right. and... When you're right, you're right. I was born, raised, baptized, had my first communion, had my confirmation, was married in the Catholic Church. And uh, I am not happy with who is elected the Pope. You know, it may be God's choice. Uh, I will accept that. He has a purpose. And maybe it would be the purpose is to open the eyes of the Catholics around the world to see what a mistake was made. Uh, to help them redirect the church back to its proper path. Because the next Pope, I'm sure, will be a Donald Trump type. Um, it's one of the reasons why I left the Catholic faith because I saw its tendency leaning towards socialism and embracing communism. Um, that is not what I think Christ wanted. As a matter of fact, that is not the way Christ's church was started. And that is why I stay now a profound Anglican Episcopalian. It's amazing wow. how they uh, come um, up with the Pope. What is it? <laughs> They have a bunch of uh, dudes uh, sitting around in a room, and they have to wait Cardinal. for the the white smoke. Uh, Curtis is something like that. No, no. It? What what it is well, is the cardinals. White smoke and white. Uh, it's it, what happens they made a is decision, the white smoke. Comes yeah. What happens is the the next pope mm. is chosen from the uh, college of cardinals. The college of cardinals Cardinal. go through into sequester, and then they debate and discuss who they would like to see raised to the next to become Pope. And this goes on. It's a political thing. It's a prayerful thing. And they go on and make the discussion. And it goes on sometimes for days, weeks, and it's been known to go on for months. And every single day, if a Pope is not selected, then black smoke will go out of the chimney. Once the Pope is selected, then you will see the white smoke. But it is from the Cardinal, from the Car College of Cardinals that the next Pope would be selected. I don't think... Well, see, think there you go. Been... This is why you have to listen to Southern Says. You learn something new every show. Yeah. Annie. 
But I, I'm trying to remember because something in the back of my brain says that there was a pope selected that was not part of the co- College of Cardinals. But I, I forget my history, so I'm just leaving that door open. If someone can correct me or give me the proper information, I'll be happy to, to put it forward. But uh, as I said, I was baptized. I was my first communion, my uh, confirmation, my marriage. I actually even taught Sunday school in the Catholic Church. Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> you can't get any more Catholic than being an Italian, German, Roman Catholic. And believe me, my mother's an Italian, Roman Catholic. <laughs> she works for the bishop. <laughs> and she told me one day uh, when she asked if Yanni and I were going to exchange our vows in the Catholic Church. And I said, no, we're going to exchange it in our church we go to. And she told me I was going to burn in hell. My mother still loves me, but she still told me I'm going to burn in hell. <laughs> That's how Catholic and Vito knows what I'm talking about in the chat room. Vito, <laughs> okay. yeah, Vito, Mama Mia, no Sharia, Vito. He would know, of course. <laughs> He's a good Catholic boy. He's a New Yorker, <laughs> as this one is too. <laughs> how you doing, Vito? Mm. And moving said the topic is close to home, and I, I thank you for that. You know, um, I think my first uh, time I was really disappointed with the Catholic Church is, and I know I. I talked about this before is that as a police officer we were responding to a case of a break-in at the catholic church and we get there and we went into the office that was broken into and what they were doing was they were producing illegal green cards for illegal immigrants and Mm. christ said give unto caesar that which is caesar and christ also said that you follow the law and when you see the church deliberately violating the law and that's when I begin to say, you are not following the teachings of Christ, so how can I follow you? And that's when I started to walk away, honestly. So that was my break with the Catholic uh-huh. faith. I mean, if they ever change, uh-huh. go back. But, you know, the, there is a difference uh, between the Catholic faith and other Christian faiths. The Catholic faith, it is uh, controlled from the top, the Pope, on down. Like a monar- uh-huh. monarchy, uh, where is... Uh, most of the Christian faiths that you find here in the United States, I can't answer for all, but especially for mine, the Episcopalian, it is from the bottom up. Yes, you have a bishop. Uh, yes, you have a rector or whatever, but they are shepherds. It is the flock that is the heart of the congregation, whereas in the Catholic Church, it is the pope that is the heart of the congregation. We flip it the other way, and now the congregation in our church participates fully. Whereas in the Catholic Church, it is the leadership that does the participation and you follow. And that's why I feel it's more towards the teaching of Christ in the religion I've chosen to follow. Okay? Well, now that we were serious. Me is, that, is that people are determined um, for the person of the priest. And from what I've known about you know, priesthood, just with. They are very progressive, so it, it, it's not surprising to me that some of his policies would, you know, favor, you know, what we see here in the United States on the left. I, I just, you know, I can't understand how people don't know their history, you know. Well, Vito writes that, you know, this is another thing that turned a lot of people off of the Catholic Church, the covering up of the pedophilia that was in the church, the other sexual assaults that were going on within the church. Uh-huh. Instead of facing yeah. them openly and saying, hey, we've got a problem, let's let's clean out the rat's nest, let's say, hey, listen, yes, we're wrong, we beg for your forgiveness, we beg for the forgiveness of God. Instead, they covered it up, and that is a really big uh-huh. sticking point with a lot of people, why a lot of people have left the Catholic faith. You know, people are starting to go back. Um, I, I'm finding in my own congregation, we're we're gaining more and more people. Um, I was talking to um, one of our deacons, you know, right after the Christmas service, we were asking, you know, how many people showed up. And it came over to something like 20, I did a quick count as he was throwing the numbers at me, 2,400 people for the, the Catholic, uh, not the Catholic, the Christmas services. And they had uh, three on uh, Christmas Eve and one on Christmas Day. So between those four services, they were averaging 600 people, but there were 1,900 on the Midnight Mass, and they had to been sit out the door because I know how many people can sit in there. You can't get 1,900, but they had that many that were around there. That must have been awesome. 
would have loved to have been there, but instead, you know, I was, circumstances didn't allow me to, to well, go. But I got to say, you know, this is, I have to say out to my uh, deacon out there, um, Jim Cato, he came to the hospital uh, that Sunday after the Christmas service and he, he blessed my husband who was sleeping. And then down the hall, another parishioner was there and we walked over to her room and we said a little brief service and had our communion. And I, that that's what I like. That's what I, I, I brings you closer. It means a lot when something like that can happen. Well, you know, I'm not Catholic, but I miss the days when they used to have their mass in Latin. Mm. I always thought that was colorful and it just sounds great in the movies. <laughs> <laughs> Medici Dominici Ecum Spiritu Tuo. Oh, I remember a lot because I used to be able to recite it in Latin. And uh, the, the one thing is some of the churches back then, and I'm talking about in the 60s, would help you understand what was being said. So you understood when they were saying it in Latin what the actual words were. It did help that, you know, my grandparents and my mom's, well, actually my grandparents spoke Italian, so you were able to piece some of the words together. So, <laughs> But it, it actually, unfortunately, what it would do is it would place a distance between the participant and the church itself. As long as they held that mystery over you, and that's what it was. it was. I think it was a matter in which to control the congregation. You know, so you curse them out in Latin, and the person's going to say, "Thank you, you know, Father. You know, thank you for the blessing, and go home." <laughs> so you never knew what the priest was saying. <laughs> wow. Oh man! But it lo- looks like I'm going to have to uh, give Rodney a little bit of a cursing out because uh, he seems to be missing. I'm sure it's something that happened that because as of last night when I spoke to uh, Scott, his uh, agent, that everything was okie dokie. And I've got, I don't know, Benny keeps on trying to climb on my lap. No cat claws. I've got enough cuts and scratches. <laughs> do, you, do you think maybe he can't call in? Because you guys had to dial me in. This is the second time That's you guys po- have had to dial me in. It is so strange, Annie and Curtis, when I go to your guys' um, guest call-in number, it rings. It just rings and rings. So nobody's picking up. And... <laughs> When when do uh, the Blog Talk Radio uh, geniuses get back? I think it's, what, tomorrow? So maybe one of you guys will want to have a little chat with them about that. <laughs> yeah. well, I tried well, to get on your show last week, uh, Cal, and I did get on for a while, but then I got bumped out <laughs> when Annie got on. <laughs> so I don't know what, what happened there, but I don't well, know. The, the CTR... Well, I, w- I want to give a shout out to everyone that's listening in. I want to say thank you for go- you guys out there, Golf Dogs, or Hope, uh, Moving, uh, Vito. We got Sue that's also called in. She's, she's called in, so if she's in, then it's possible the lines are open. And I got to say, Sue was saying Rush Limbaugh at the same time I did. <laughs> Good going, Sue. <laughs> <laughs> although although I want to remind people that you will still find me up on toptalkradio.com I'm still sitting at number 16 I'm still my smiling face two rows below Rush Limbaugh so that's a good reason why I want to talk to Rush how do I get up to that road to be right next to him <laughs> I'll give him a call <laughs> <laughs> make him an offer he can <laughs> oh now you sound like the godfather oh I'm making, making it up, but I can't to refuse. refuse. <laughs> my favorite accent. Indeed. Uh, he, was a, he was a lousy father, but he was a great actor. <laughs> oh, well. Um, she said she had no trouble calling in, so the lines are open. If anyone wants to call in and join the conversation, we're just BSing here, guys. We're just killing the next 25 minutes. So if you want to call in and join, moving, you know, come on, call in, golf door, call in, Vito. If, even if you're at work, Vito, don't tell the boss, call in. <laughs> don't tell the boss, call in. <laughs> hey, listen, I got a question. Have you, guys, have you guys heard about this school? Let me see. Now, I do have this one here. It was... Here we go, and I'm looking for the name of the school. In San Antonio, Texas, Marshall High School, uh, reports revealed that the teacher asked all the teens, now that this is teacher allowed a teen, these two teens or whatever, to perform the skit titled Trump Assassination. And reports revealed the teacher asked all the teens to submit their skits for approval ahead of time. In other words, the teacher should have caught this little screw-up. Either she didn't do her job or she was okay with an assassination presentation. So the kids get up on the stage, they start the presentation, 
And all of a sudden, the school officials realize what's going on, and they yank it. Should never have happened. But this, people, is what our liberal teachers are doing with your kids. Do you hear about this one, guys? Oh, I sure did. Oh, man. Yeah, that that created a lot of uh, controversy for sure. The assassination of Donald Trump. It almost reminds me of this uh, movie that was put out about the the assassination of uh, George W. Bush. And, uh, like, I'm sorry, but what on earth were they thinking? Really? Really? Hey, kids, today we're going to put on a skit. Here's your uh, script. So we're going to practice this, and we're going to perform it as a, at the school assembly. Oh, what's it about, teacher? Oh, it's about the assassination of Donald Trump. Oh, groovy teacher. Like, what is wrong with these people? Yep, now you can do this with Donald Trump. Now I take you back to the administration of the second George Bush, George W., and when the Game of Thrones came out, if anyone remembers, whose head was on the spike in the Game of Thrones? Whose head was on the spike on the Game of Thrones? It was George Bush's head was on the spike in the Game of Thrones, which was an HBO TV series. Now, did anyone complain about that? Anyone complain about that? No. But now they have Donald Trump. Yep. Now, I'll take you back again. During the administration of Obozo, which is still going on, unfortunately, for another 24 days, um, remember the rodeo clown down in Texas? who wore an Obama mask in the the ring? The rodeo clown who lost his job because he was wearing the Obama mask? He wasn't advocating violence against Obama. He was wearing a mask. He's worn the George Bush mask before. No one complained. So this time he wore an Obama yeah. mask. And he gets fired. He gets threatened. But doing an assassination skit for Donald Trump, that's perfectly fine. Putting George Bush's head on a spike, decapitated head on a spike, on the Game of Thrones on HBO TV, that's perfectly fine. Do you see the do you see the pattern here, folks? Do you see the pattern? And Vito's right. That rodeo yeah. clown wore Reagan, he wore Bush, he wore Clinton also. Yep. Didn't say anything about Clinton, that was perfectly fine. I uh, did I think he at one point he also wore a Nixon mask, if I remember correctly, Vito. But the second he put Obozo on, he gets he gets trampled. This is what we're dealing well, with. Did any one of did, did any one of you two hear about the salvo that um, Obama supposedly sent to the Trump camp about there can only be one president at a time because he he thought the elected um, president was too outspoken right now. <laughs> oh, I'm the only one that heard about that. There was there was a there was a statement that he made. That's not exactly what he said. He was basically saying, um, "I'm gonna, I, I would not do the transition the way he's doing it." But then again, you know, um, I'm just going to respect. But once I'm a private citizen, I have the freedom of speech and I have the duty and obligation to speak out. But he's not following the pattern of past presidents, not following the pattern that George Washington set up, that once you step out of office, you don't make bad comments about or policy comments once you're out of office. You're out of office, your term is over, you're done. This is what past presidents have done, except Jimmy Carter lately. Jimmy Carter started, you know, pipe up out of, you know, the woodwork here. Instead, Obama said, all right, fine, you do the transition team. But once I'm out of office... I'm going to exercise my my right as a citizen to be vocal. And this is going to be very... I want to know, the people in the chat room and listening in and everywhere, what do you think Obama's next project will be once he's out of office? I'm saying he's going to go on Dancing with the Stars. I mean, what's the next thing we're going to see Obozo do once he's out of office, besides a game of golf? Cal, what do you think? I think he's going to revise his role in the History Channel's miniseries, The Bible. <laughs> <laughs> now, Vito said, Vito's saying that Obama's ego will not let him shut up. And I agree. He, he, he wants to remain relevant. He's going to try to rewrite. Oh, he, oh, I like this one. Sit in for Stephen Colbert <laughs> on Comedy Channel. Oh, that's a good oh, one. Oh, gosh. A good one. 
You know, he said that um, if he had a ran this time a third time, he would have beaten Trump. <laughs> 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 so maybe he wants to uh, write an executive order where he gets to wear a belt, you know. <laughs> oh, Hope and is cold. President. Oh, Golf Dog <laughs> and Hope are really cold. <laughs> Golf said he's going to hit the Chicago underground male bathhouses, <laughs> and Hope followed up saying, "I heard he's coming out of the closet." <laughs> you mean you know? You know the, the, it's interesting. There's a lot of articles going out there. And remember, folks, we are living in the fake news era. Get your hashtags out there over there at Twitter. But I'm, I've been reading some very strange stories about uh, Barack Hussein Obama. Mm, I, I I don't know if we're going to be hearing uh, wheat from chaff or, or chaff or whatever. It. It's just I've been hearing some very strange stories about his past, but it's kind of like, how can we hear stories about his past? Because nobody knows his past. You notice that? Or if they do know their past, they're now dead. I would like to find out out everything that feels about this guy's background, his school records, his health records, everything. First, Mm. I would like to see what's really kind of things that they're not telling us. Now, Vito well, says, I'd like to actually uh, meet his former classmates, and and not people coming out who are saying, "Yeah, I went to that school. I I never knew the dude. He did, he no, wasn't the, in my class." There yeah. is there is someone yeah. that came out uh, when he was running for for president the first time. Uh, the name of the gentleman escapes me, but he was rather vocal about you know being familiar with him and being in the same class, the same professor, and saying that, you know, Obama is a Freud. But Vito put something up very, very interesting. I didn't look at it this way, honestly. He said he could be appointed the DNC chair, which is why they're taking so long to anoint him. That is really a very good point. It is a possibility because Keith Ellison, uh, people are starting to back off on him, and he's lost a lot of faith. Mm-hmm. He's still fighting for the position, and he's still thinking he's the anointed one. But it would make it very interesting. And uh, you know what, Vito, I think you might be right. That might be his new position, which also explains why they want to stay in the D.C. area. If you notice, they, they have the house now well, in the think, D.C. area. Right, right. I think he was- I was thinking he was hoping that um, Hillary would win so he could be appointed to the Supreme Court. You know, this guy likes to lecture everybody. He thinks he's um, all Mm. that anyway. So why not the Supreme Court, you know? Mm. Now, um, he... You know, after all the good, we did have one president who did serve on the Supreme Court after his presidency, and that was Taft. Right, right. Now, um, Vito... Puts down Wayne Simmons. Forgive my ignorance. I don't know who Wayne Sim- Simmons is. Uh, I'm missing something here. And oh, thank you, uh, moving. He's leaving to go make dinner. He's sending prayers. Thank you very much. All the prayers are are uh, are deeply appreciated. And uh, the fact that Yanni called me while we were having the show just buoyed me because he has not picked up the phone to talk to anyone since he went into the hospital on the 18th. The fact he actually picked up the phone and used it uh, just just blew my heart away. Oh, man. This has been a crazy show. We've got yeah. just uh, 15 minutes left. Uh, gosh. <laughs> and it's been all ad-lib, the whole thing. Oh, did you guys hear that uh, there there is now a congresswoman going after Sheriff David Clark? You guys catch this? Um, I have it here. No, I think the government was going after him. Uh, this, this one uh, sicked uh, the Department of Justice. All right. Uh, I've got it here. No, 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 no. That's that's Joe the plumber. That's money laundering. Uh, that's sanctuary cities. Uh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Curtis can uh, t- attest. <laughs> Curtis will attest. I have the articles, you know, that I've all printed out with highlights and everything else, things circled. So that when I go through it, if I need a subject or something like that, it's right there. And plus, I've got another two inches of articles underneath from everything from radical Islam to God knows what. Wow. Um, All right. Congressman Gwaine Moore. And she has forwarded a complaint to the Department of Justice. The Department of Justice is accepting the complaint. And the complaint is, is that in the past six months, there have been four deaths in the Milwaukee County Jail. Of those deaths included a newborn baby, 
that was, catch this, drum roll, delivered by one of the inmates. Not by a medical staff, not by a doctor, not in a hospital, but by a fellow inmate. What the hell is a fellow inmate doing delivering a baby? Why wasn't you know, uh, she brought to the infirmary if she's pregnant? You know, obviously, you're pregnant, you're going to be monitored. Hmm. So how can you blame this on Clark if the proper s- procedure by the inmates reporting a medical emergency is not done? Now, anyone knows anything about the prison system, I'm sorry, it's not a cakewalk. I mean, they may get inside and get three hots and a cots and a gym and TV and access to the telephone and access to the Internet. Oh, yeah, they are pampered little babies. You know, God forbid they don't get their, their three squares and a, and a cot. But in this case, you're in a prison. You've got prison gangs. You've got various circumstances. Out of those six, those four deaths in six months, how do you know one is not from natural causes such as old age or because of yeah. a medical health condition such as cancer or AIDS? Um, how do you know that one is not possibly a suicide? How do you know that maybe one wasn't shipped? You know, there could be so many different circumstances. And if you're only going to you know, say on this one and blame the, sh- the sheriff who's in charge of the entire county, so he's in charge of the police, all the law enforcement, as well as the prison system. Now, I'm, how can you do this? You would have to go after every single sheriff or every single law enforcement that's controlling a prison uh, uh, facility. Yeah. It is a dangerous world in there, guys. And the guys that are in there are not sweethearts. These are bad dudes. They're behind bars because they are the committed. They committed some sort of a crime, whether it is a misdemeanor or a felony. And the vast majority of them behind there are felons. Misdemeanors are usually put into a county facility, a a a, a, a jail compared to a prison. You know, it is another witch hunt. So now they're going after David Clark. And uh, I think the yes, I think the left is good at just throwing things up in the air to see what sticks. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the target yeah. is hopefully always one of us, you know. So I don't know. When it comes to their people, though, we can't seem to make anything stick, even though it's obvious that they broke the law or something like that, like a Hillary or, or the Fast and Furious under Eric Holder, or even something as, as blatant as the um, new Black Panthers keeping, you know, people from voting, you know, by intimidating them in uh, Philadelphia. But nothing happens, you know. Well, we're going to see with the new Attorney General, Jeff Sessions, coming in, and I don't think a lot of this is going to go flying. You know, Loretta Lynch declared the LBGT, XYZ, MLOP community to be a protected class. And now you take that a little step further to North Carolina with the transgender bathroom question. You know, you get attacked in a transgender bathroom, you cannot file a criminal complaint because that transgender is now part of a protected class. So it's free for you to be assaulted, but you cannot prosecute. I am hoping to see all of this BS reversed. And I'd like to see it reversed as soon as possible. Sooner, if not later. How about like the day before Trump takes office? (laughs) That soon is how I'd like to see it. Thank you. And I don't think Trump will have any problem placing his hands on the Bible and taking the oath. My understanding is that um, the first, at least the first time, Obama, uh, somebody um, had to take the oath back at the um, White House or something like that. But who knows? He might have had his hands on the Quran. Now, Kelly, you just put up an article about David Clark on the airplane. This is something I did not hear about. I heard about the one with hmm. Ivanka uh, on the airplane. But what happened with David Clark? He was He was harassed and he took him down? Yeah, apparently he was on a flight uh, last September, and he is a well-known conservative and supporter of Donald Trump. I guess that he was on uh, an airline, and he was uh, harassed by a fellow passenger who was uh, heckling him and saying, hey, you're not one of us. And the the, the person was very, very abusive towards uh, Sheriff Clark, apparently. And they arrested him. He was... um, Clearly intoxicated. (laughs) (laughs) He was just harassing. He he recognized David Clark on the plane and was just harassing David Clark. And I think that uh, David Clark actually ended up 
um, detaining him, physically <laughs> detaining him until the plane landed and the uh, the authorities could come on and uh, handcuff him and get him off the plane. But, yeah, uh, apparently this happened in September. <laughs> uh, where are the air marshals? Well, you know what? That's the thing. Some flights don't have the air marshals because there are a oh. lot of local flights. He might have been flying locally where there might not have been air marshals on the plane. Yeah, he could have been on what we call a puddle well, jumper. That's possible. You right. Know, the, there's not enough air yeah. marshals to go on, you know, unless it's a long-distance flight, you know, like New York to L.A. or international, then you'll find the air marshals. But a little tiny puddle jumper, you're most likely not going to see an air marshal. But uh, I love this one with um, poor Ivanka Trump and these two mm. idiots, um, a husband and husband team. Let's put it this way. Yeah. And they thought they were being so cute. Yeah. One, one is and a their professor. baby. Don't forget the husband and husband's baby. Ah, oh, jeez. Yeah. Oh, both are gay Jewish New Yorkers. Uh, one is an attorney who should know better, and one is a professor whose intellect level should have been a little bit higher than it actually is. Uh, Daniel Goldstein and Matthew Lasner. And they turned around and in a tweet said, Ivanka, just before JetBlue kicked us off our flight, when a flight attendant heard my husband expressing displeasure about flying with the Trumps. Uh, excuse me? And then he claims that he was whispering when the whole freaking plane heard him. Really? Uh, first off, you know, if you don't like the politics of someone... And you're on in a, in a in a situation like you're on a plane or a bus or something like that. You're in a confined spot. Shut the hell up. Sit down. You're not part of the conversation. Don't butt in. Just simply don't butt in. She's got her two kids in front of, with her. And the main thing is, you do not approach a mother and two kids, and do what you did. Not in front of children. Never in front of innocent children. And you never turn around and and harass. A child who Ivanka is of a politician. Their polit politics may be polar opposite. You don't know. You have no idea. If you don't like her father, then sit down, shut up, don't say a word to her. You don't have to say anything. If she was not talking politics and being out loud and, un and rowdy, then there's no reason for you to get off your lazy butt and get in her face and do what you did. That is not only rude. That is completely amoral. God, if that man was in oh. front of me, I probably would have punched him out. <laughs> oh, you know, and, and she was so gracious. She was so gracious. Uh, she just turned her back and was occupying her children with uh, coloring books and things. Oh, look, kids. Oh, look at the book catalog. Oh, let's do some drawings, kids. She was so gracious. That's all I have to add to that. Yeah. yeah, and Golf Dog said, too bad Sheriff Clark wasn't on the plane. Would have been two guys in disarray, two gay guys in disarray. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, I hope, oh, oh, thank you, because I've got six cats in the house here. So she says, more than one way to skin a cat. No, I mean rats. <laughs> <laughs> Although I have you threatened to... I've threatened to send my uh, my kitten, the six month old uh, baby, who we also call puppy. I said, "You're going to be Chinese restaurant number nine if you don't behave." <laughs> Go ahead, Curtis. Well, I think it's going to take the whole four years for the um, liberals to get over the election of Donald Trump, and I think that once they begin to recover, he's going to win again. <laughs> well, second term. This is and my prediction. This is my prediction for the new year. Now, listen, folks, and listen very carefully. If you want to have a good stock portfolio, if you want to make money this coming year, come January 19th, buy stocks in Valium, Thorazine, Ativan, Wellbutrin, any <laughs> psychotropic. Go out there, buy as many of these stocks as you can stash yourself okay. up on them and if you want to make it even better see if you can get yourself some scripts for that you know for the don't, don't i'm not telling you this just, just listen <laughs> listen and stand on the corner and every single liberal you go free samples free samples oh yeah <laughs> <laughs>
man. I want to thank you guys because we're ending the show on such great laughter. And, and believe me, I, I really do intend one day I'm going to sit down and I'm honestly going to write the book. And I'm gonna, the book is going to be called, if I ever get around to doing this, In Life, There Must Be Love and Laughter. And I think of anything, this show has proved that there is love and laughter in life. And without it, we we would lose our humanity. And with you guys being such great, wonderful listeners, wonderful friends, I do consider you all of you out there my friends. And I thank you for the support, and I thank you for enjoying the show. And just spread the word. Just tell people to come on and say, hey, listen, this woman's a whack job. She's not politically correct, but you'll have fun. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's what makes you so special. Oh, thank you. Um, we're probably going to. Oh, thank you. We're probably going to rebroadcast the show on Friday because I'm going to take Friday off. You know, I'm, I want to spend uh, the end of the, the year with my husband and we will be back next year. Um, matter of fact, um, Kel, I did send a Skype message to uh, Vlad. Uh, he has to get back to me. Um, because I haven't been able to get on Skype with him. So I said, just hold him to oh, message, yeah. me, yeah. message me on Skype so that we can set up. Vlad Teps will be on our show on January 10th. Um, so if you want oh, to... Oh, he's, he's looking forward to it. Yeah. Oh, I, I forgot to tell you. Um, he's at the farm for Christmas. <laughs> so he only has his cell phone. <laughs> oh. uh, well, listen, Sue was sending me, oh my goodness, Scott Bayo and his daughter were attacked at a school function for supporting Trump. And good, he's pressing charges. Excellent. That's what we have to do. We should Amen. not just s- sit back and take it. I mean, if we are attacked, you know, press charges. I say this all the time. You know, one, the best way to fight back is hit them in the wallet. You know, if they swing at you, you hit them in the wallet. Hit them where it hurts. Hit them right smack in their bank account. All right, fine. We will play the same game. You want to use Southern Poverty Law Firm on us? Hey, I got my attorney mm. here. My attorney trumps right. yours. They bring the knife, you bring the gun. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> they send one to the <laughs> hospital, you send one to the cemetery. I go and try Connery line. <laughs> yes. Oh, uh, yes. Elliot Ness. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone for listening in. I really do have to get a new closer for the uh, new year. I'll be working on that, hopefully. So forgive me. I'm going to use an old one. And I want to wish everyone a very Merry Christmas. May you have a blessed, happy one. Enjoy your family and friends while you have them. Don't ever forget to stop to say, I love you, and give someone you love a hug. My hug goes out to all of you out there. And I'm going to wish you a very, very merry and prosperous new year. We're looking forward to Trump coming into office and the nation coming back to its senses. So until I, then, I say to Kel and Curtis, thank you for joining me. Thank you for your love and support through this time I've been going through. And Yanni also thanks uh, everyone out there to all of you listening in. Until then, I say good night and God bless. God bless you, Annie and Curtis. I'd love to uh, sleep, Sue. Take care, Joe. I'll keep it. If you find yourself in trouble, count on me, my friend. I'll get right up. Trouble. You've been listening to Southern Sense Blog Talk Radio. Producer and your hostess extraordinaire. Is Ninety Andy seconds. Blitz. The theme music, American Stand Up, is written and performed by Don Fortney. For more from Don, check out his webpage, tpartymusic.web.com. Southern Sense. The proud member of Ghost Fighter Radio and Freedom Media Network. Southern Sense is common sense. Take it out, Don. 60 seconds. American.
look me straight in the eye. Tell me what you see. I'll tell the truth every time. Yes, you can count on me. I've got the backbone. Ten seconds. American. I've got the heart. American. I've got the will. American. Will you stand up? Don't sit down. Stand up. Don't back down. Stand up. Shout it out. Stand up. Let's make it loud. American. 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 American.